been talking at certain conferences and seminars during the last 10 years of my career, but today it's a privilege for me because I'm together with my sort of ex-colleagues because I used to be an ELT professional uh, many, many years ago when I was younger. So I'm really uh, more than excited today because I'm with you with these brilliant ELT prof professionals. So thank you for inviting me today. Um, what I'm doing during the last 15 years, actually, I started generational studies uh, in the year 2000 sharp. And in this previous 15 years, I've been on an interesting and a, a joyful journey of analyzing generations and their uh, motivational patterns. And my, uh, actually, my uh, field of study is organizational attractiveness. So what I'm doing during the last couple of years is uh, rather helping organizations to be more, say, attractive to recruit and retain new generation clients, internal clients or external clients. And um, actually, Bilgi is one of my clients, uh, one of the organizations or, or foundations that I've been working with during the last couple of years. So uh, wherever we go, we see that there is a significant generational understanding. And what I'm doing is I am very much sensitive about supporting what I have been doing with concrete data. So I love data. And and uh, on the other side of the coin, I'm a researcher. I'm representing a global company here, which is called Universum. And we have been operating in 52 countries in the world. It's a global organization working with uh, young generation, generations particularly attending at universities. All over the world, we are in contact with um, more than 500,000 Gen Yers, young generation people, and I'm responsible for the Turkish and the Middle Eastern operations of this, of this organization. And every single year, we are in contact with 30 universities, including Bilgi University. We are in contact with 30 universities uh, around the country, and we are having uh, researchers, uh, we are having a vast research based study with over 30,000 Turkish Gen Yers every single year. And maybe you have come across with our articles because we generally publish the articles at Harvard Business Review Turkey on every September issue. So this year, we are going to publish our new uh, research on this year's outcome with more than 32,000 Gen Yers in Turkey. But today, um, I will be speaking about speaking more about last year's survey because now we are um, about to launch this year's one. So generations, yes, um, it is a way of systems thinking, and um, what I'm doing is to understand not a certain generation but the generational map. Looking at this map, actually, we have we have got more than one generation here. It is a generational mix that we should understand. So if you want to understand a certain generation, it is trivial to understand a certain generation because it has its ramifications in the pre preceding uh, other generations. So um, generations is not here to label people. It doesn't mean that you are a Gen Yer, so you generally behave this way or that way, but it's a very strong tool and a very strong lens to understand certain patterns. So it is just a tool, okay? It's not the certain outcome. Generational systems thinking is a tool to segment our internal clients, for example, our employees or our external clients. Looking at foundation schools or looking at schools, actually I'm working with over 300 companies in the region, in uh, the UAE and in Turkey. And looking at these uh, 300, uh, more than 300 companies, uh, I would love to work more with schools, actually, because if we have the chance to work more with schools, even with high schools, with secondary schools, even with elementary schools, then I feel that we would be more able to lead the change when these kids grow up and join the workforce, the working uh, environment. But unfortunately, I am working with a few secondary schools uh, in Turkey, and when I'm working with schools, particularly with the foundation schools, I see that generational thing has two ramifications. One, the learner, yes, you have got new learners. Your new learners are a young generation, but there is, on the other side of the coin, there's another ramification that we should pay very big focus, which is current employees. I mean, now that we are a big foundation school, we also have Gen Y teachers. Would you agree with me? So I think we should start from understanding Gen Y teachers, Gen Y instructors, Gen Y 
English language teaching professionals, and then I think we should go to understand Gen Y learners and then Gen Z learners as well. So, looking at this map, actually in Turkey, in the um, organizational life, we have been working with two generations, which is a very big drawback of our organizational culture in Turkey. Normally, two generations are working together in Turkey, which is Gen X and Gen Y, and the big uh, gap and uh, the biggest conflict is between these two generations significantly, Gen Xers and Gen Ys, but who are they? Let me help you to understand which generation you belong to, but uh, let me emphasize very strongly that I am talking about generations in the Middle Eastern context, okay? Not on a global context, because when you go to the Western developed economies, uh, the years may differ, so uh, I'm going to talk about Turkey and the neighborhood countries. Those of you who were born after 1980, can you please notify yourself? Those of you who were born after 1980, 1980, yeah, we have a huge, huge, huge population of Gen Yers here. So, it's going to be hard, harder for me to talk about this generation to, uh, to this generation because I'm not a Gen Yer. Those of you who raised your hands, uh, could you please go back and check those of you who were born in 1980, 81 and 82, could you please raise your hands again? Yes. This group, which I call in Turkish is Araf generation. <laughs> These are just in middle, so they are a bit uh, confused because there is a big oppression from the Gen Xers, and, but they are also in tune with the Gen Yers as well. Um, but it's a transition period, 1980, 81, 82. So in Turkey, we have got 27 million Gen Yers. Does this appeal to you? So you have no chance but to listen and understand the codes of this generational understanding. And those of you who were born between 1965 up to 1979, could you please raise your hands? Yes, there we are, Gen Xers, Gen Xers. Do you know why they call us Gen X? Because it's X, okay? <laughs> what, we have, what we have experienced, it is already X. Yeah, and those of you who were born in between 1945 to 1964, could you please raise hands? And there comes my thing, can we give a big applause because this is what I do generally. <laughs> baby boomers, yes, baby boomers. Well, in professional life, unfortunately, in Turkey, we don't have enough baby boomers. That's not because they are old, that's because there was a a law which, wa which was passed uh, in 1990, sharp, and that law enabled young baby boomers of the time to get retired earlier. That's why Turkish professional life lost their baby boomers at a very young age, which is a very big problem, and we call it organizational amnesia. So organizational minds start to become more problematic because they lost their baby boomers in 1990. That's why after 1990s, Turkish organizational life started to become uh, a two generations system, which is a big problem in the organizational systems thinking. I'm going to mention more about this. So the students that you are preparing for the real life, for the um, business life actually, are going to have a very big problem in Turkey, which is they are going to struggle with two generations. But normally when you go to the Western world, when you look at the developed top 12 economies, still there are three or four generations working together. So it is a richness, it is diversity, and it's inclusion, so it's very valuable. But in Turkey we have a certain problem, and in the neighborhood countries it is like this again. But you know what, normally companies invite me to speak about Gen Yers, and I ask them, okay, because for the last 15 years I'm working on this thing as a researcher, as a business consultant. And, but in the last couple of years, I ask this question, why do you invite me to talk about Gen Yers? And they say to me, uh, well, we ha um, we're planning to get prepared for this new generation. And I say, I have some bad news for you. Because the last Gen Yer was born 15 years ago. During the last 15 years, no Gen Yer is born. So if you want to get prepared, you had better get prepared for another generation, which is Gen Z. Those of you who started giving birth in the year 2000, could you please raise your hands? Those of you who have kids that were born after 2000, could you please raise your hands? 
If you want to get prepared for a new generation, that is the future of Turkey and all the developing world, if you ask me. So Gen Zers, Gen Z, it is a very important cluster in our generational studies, and we should instantly start having a different outlook on them. How are we going to teach them? How are, how are we going to sell them new ideas, new models? And what is a way that we can teach from them? But let me uh, put aside the rest of the generations and let me go back to Gen Yers. Actually, now in Turkey, we have almost 78 million people living. It's a big, big country. Um, do, do I have a board marker here? Or can you? Or <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure, yeah. I'm sure all of you have in your bags, huh? I used to carry board markers. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate, I appreciate. You have a big set of board markers. <laughs> so looking at 10 wires, 35% of Turkish population consists of 10 wires. It's huge, huh? There are 27 million people uh, who belong to this certain generation. Now I want to ask you, what do you think about Gen Yers in Turkey, in your classrooms, and among your, among your colleagues, there are a lot of Gen Yers like we have here. What do you think about Gen Yers? How, what kind of people are they? What do you think? Share your paradigms with me. Go ahead. You don't have to be politically correct. Go ahead, yeah. What do you think about them? What do you observe about Gen Yers? Multitasking. Multitasking, okay, go ahead. Self-confident, Self go ahead. Go, sorry? What did you say? Self-centered, okay, what else? Sorry? Cautious, cautious or what? Cautious, okay, what else? Sorry? Demanding, yes, demanding. What else? Sorry? Risk taker, okay. What else? Sorry? Well informed, sorry? Well educated, huh? Well educated? Well educated, okay, what else? Ambitious. Ambitious, yes. And how about with respect to the, when we are recruiting them, when we're having new generation young English language teachers in the profession, what kind of professional behaviors do they have? Hard question, huh? What kind of behaviors do they have, young English language teaching professionals, when we are recruiting them? Yeah, this question is not for Gen Wires. Yeah, can you? Immature? Thank you. <laughs> Immature. Yes, good. What else? Egocentric. Egocentric, okay. <laughs> yeah. Now we start. Now we start, yeah. Sorry? <laughs> Unconscious? <laughs> Taking initiatives. Innovative. What else? So, uh, today, an ordinary Gen Wire stays in an organization for 2.4 years. This is the Turkish statistics now. When we employ, when we recruit a certain Gen Wire to a certain organization, that is the average period of time that he or she stays in an organization, 2.4 years. So it means that we are very much willing to label them as, we older generations, we are very much prone to label them as? Indecisive, unstable, not loyal, this and that. But we can talk about these um, adjectives or labels until up until morning, but I'm going to put a question mark here and I'm going to ask another question, according to whom? According to whom? So, we might need a paradigm shift actually, because looking down on generations is a learned behavior and it's not something new. 
Let me introduce you to a guy whom I adore a lot. I'm sure you all know him very well, but I'm just going to remind you that there was once upon a time such a guy, and his name is Plato. You know Plato? He lived uh, on, uh, in the fourth, fourth century before Christ, and Plato said, what is happening to our young people? They disrespect their elders, they disobey their parents, they ignore the law, they riot in the streets inflamed with wild notions, their morals are decaying, what is to become of them? So apparently Plato didn't trust the young generation. Now looking down on uh, young generations, it is a learned behavior. That's why we should be very careful before labeling them, because we may need a paradigm shift. There's another guy whom I adore more even, and his name is Hesiod. He's one of my best philosophers in the world. And before Christ, he lived uh, in the eighth century, and he said, I see no hope for the future of our people if they are dependent on frivolous youth of today. For certainly all youth are reckless beyond words. When I was young, we were taught to be discreet and respectful of elders, but the present youth are exceedingly wise and impatient of restraint. So there is nothing new. So this generation system's thinking might be new. Actually, uh, as a scientific area, it has been studied since 1970s, and I've been in this biz business and in this field for, the, for, for 15 years now, but Nothing is new when we are labeling people who do not look like us, who do not resemble our background. That's why we should be very careful before we label them. But looking at the new generation, there's another misunderstanding. That's why I called the name of my speech Understanding a Misunderstood Generation. I think there is a big uh, misunderstanding about labeling the new generation uh, in such a way that these people are like this because of te technology. Because of the fast pace of change, our youth is reckless beyond words. We started t telling this. Even politicians, some um, world leaders even are telling, uh, this generation is like this because of Twitter. If the winner was not, were, were, were not there, this generation would be more, more faithful. But I think it is illogical. Uh, still, we should have a look on the technology and its fast, its fast pace of change. And I have a little quiz for you. I'm going to show you a couple of um, items that we have been using during the last um, 50 years, maybe. And I'm going to ask you a question about these items. How long did it take to reach 50 million users uh, starting with radio, let's look at radio. What do you think? How long did it take for radio to, ta to, to reach 50 million users when it was invented and when, when it was uh, started being sold? 50 million users. How long? 10 years? 10 years. What else? Other guesses you have? 50? 20? 20 years? Sorry, 30? 30, 20, 50, let's see, 35 years. So radio needed 35 years to reach 50 million clients, okay? How about television? Let's look at television. Television, 20, what else? 15, what else? 10, let's see, it was 13 years. So now uh, technology started to become better and now it took 13 years to reach 50 million clients. How about Facebook? Facebook. <laughs> Facebook. It is 10 year. This friend is now 10 years old. One day. <laughs> 50 million users actually took three years. In three years, Facebook had 50 million clients, users. And how about Instagram? Instagram. 50 million users. Six months. Very good guess. Six months. <laughs> Instagram, for Instagram, it took six months to reach 50 million users. And finally, now that we have Gen Z as our focus, let's have a look at Angry Birds. Angry Birds, how long did it take for Angry Birds to reach 50 million users? 35 days. So the question for ELT professionals is, what kind of tools are we using today? Is it the tools of the years that we were reaching 50 million clients in 35 years? Or is it the tools that is required because we are reaching 50 million clients in 35 days now? So are we talking to the clients, to the people of the 21st century with the tools, strategies, and techniques of the previous century? 
in the business life, this is our biggest drawback. This is our biggest problem because still in the business life, in the corporate arena, which I am a part of, we are trying to motivate, retain and engage our internal clients of the 21st century with the tools of the techniques, tools and the techniques of the 20th century. So this is a very big drawback. Lately, I was talking to a group of uh, finance professionals. Uh, there were like 300 or 400 people and um, belo they belong to a very big financial institution of Turkey. And I uh, mentioned about this and I said, are you talking to your internal clients, to your employees, with the tools, or tools and the techniques of the 21st century or the 20th century? Because I said, because I am a consultant to many financial institutions here in Turkey, and I feel that we are trying to retain, engage, recruit people with the techniques of 20th century. And a certain guy in the crowd raised his hand and told me, I definitely disagree with what you say. And I said, okay, I would love to hear you. And he said, my company, my bank, we, we are not definitely using the tools and techniques of the 20th century to talk to our current clients, current internal or external clients. We are using the tools and techniques of 19th century, he said. <laughs> <laughs> and you know what, sad but true, but he was right. Even at certain institutions or um, areas like finance, still we have got a lot of, a lot of, a lot of ways to go. That's why today staff turnover is incredibly high in Turkey because youngsters, young people, when they graduate from the school, when they leave you and when they meet the corporate life, they are devastated to witness what they say, what they see. So looking at Facebook, I'd love to go more uh, into Facebook. Now, Facebook users reached around 1.4 billion worldwide. 1.4 billion users now in 10 years. What kind of a number is it? Do you think it is, is it high? How is it? How does it sound? 1.4 billion customers. Is it fair? Fair enough? Actually, I have some surprise for you because China is not included here. Because because in China, uh, Facebook is banned. So they, they, they have their own Facebook, which already have 1.1 billion users. It's the Chinese Facebook. Imagine if China was also included in this statistics. But 86% are mobile users, meaning they don't have an understanding of using Facebook through a computer screen, okay? They are checking Facebook through their mobile phones. Still, in 65% uh, of the companies in Turkey, Facebook usage is banned for the employees. Employees are not allowed to use Facebook at 65% of the companies in Turkey. But what is weird is most of these companies are trying to reach their external clients through Facebook. <laughs> so we call this dissonance. There is a big, big, big dissonance between what we do and what we believe in the real life situations in the business world. So looking at Turkey, we have 32 million users in, in Turkey. 32 million users and 80% of this 32 million, they are born after 1980. And you know what, looking at the penetration, thanks to our young population, we are now top five, uh, top one in Turkey. Look at us, Turkey, UK, France, Germany and Italy. So it's a big privilege really, huh? We are proud of being the first. <laughs> but what is beneath? Why are we top one at Facebook? And interestingly enough, we might be number one in Europe for Facebook, but for another certain social platform, last year we became world leader, world penetration champion at Twitter. I don't know if you would be proud of becoming, as Turkey, becoming world penetration leader, because Turkey is the top one country now all over the world, having the highest Twitter using penetration. I don't know if you would be proud, but I am not proud. Why do you think we are top one? Yeah, it was actually, it was, um, it started with Gezi, it started with the civil disobedience movement two years ago. Um, and now we have uh, over 645 million users globally. And in Turkey, we have 12 million users at Twitter. But two years ago, before Gezi, it was, um, it was June the 31st, but before Gezi, one and a half months before Gezi, there were 5.5 million Twitter users. One month after Gezi, there were 11.5 million Twitter users. Can you imagine? But what happened 
Overnight, it became 12 million. Overnight, when? Would you recall? Now I'll show you. Overnight, one night, all Turkish users became IT professionals. <laughs> Overnight. Now I'm going to show it to you. Yes, we have this world record, 31.1% uh, penetration in Turkey. It is something, really. Uh, lately, I was talking uh, at a conference in the Middle East. The Middle East, not the developed part of the world, okay? And all the participants from different Middle Eastern countries, they, they were there, and they asked me a question. The question was, why is Turkey number one in Twitter penetration? We call this rhetorical question, which doesn't require an answer. Of course, I was speechless, because the answer is because in Turkey, our young people do not have relevant platforms at home, at schools, and in their companies to express themselves freely. That's why this is maybe one of the very rare platforms that they are sharing their uh, insights and internal feelings. So, I'm going to invite you to visit, to go back to March the 20th. Do you remember that day? March the 20th, in the midnight, something happened. March the 20th, in the midnight, Twitter was banned. It was the first banning of Twitter. By the way, if you would love to ban Twitter one day, ban it at uh, midnight, because 12 at midnight, it's a very good time to ban Twitter in Turkey, because it is the weakest period that Twitter is used. If you want to drive attraction, send your tweets between 9 p.m. and 10 p.m. It is the most popular hour, okay? In Turkey, it is the most popular hour. But most unpopular hour is, is in the midnight. So what happened when it was banned right uh, in the midnight and up until noon, in this 12 hours, now I'm going to show you how much tweets were sent even if it were banned. One point two million. Incredible. Meaning, even the corpse of this bird is tweeting. <laughs> even the corpse of it, it is tweeting, really. So the question is, is it possible to manage, lead, or teach, or instruct, or shape this generation and the upcoming one with limitations, bannings, rules, regulations, or do we need another mindset? That is the question. I didn't ask you if you were using Facebook or Twitter, but I'm going to ask about Instagram. Can you please raise hands if you are using Instagram? Instagram, it's an incredible model, and I will definitely suggest every single person sitting in this hall to have an Instagram account before dawn today, because it is really something. I'm going to show you a couple of statistics. Now we have monthly active users. We have 300 million act active users. It is just three years old, by the way. And during the last nine months, number of new users is 100 million. Can you imagine? In nine months, it is 100, new, 100 million new users. And every single day, there are 1.2 billion likes they like 1.2 billion likes on Instagram, and every second there are 1,000 comments. So it is apparently not a photography sharing platform. It is not about the photos. It is about storytelling. If you ask me, every leader, every instructor, every manager, every whatever, now in the 21st century should be a professional storyteller. And this is an incredible storytelling platform. And 90% of the users are younger than 35, which means that almost all of them are Gen Yers. And as everywhere else, we women are talking more. 68% are female and the rest are male users. Yeah, but interestingly enough, looking at Facebook, Facebook Turkey, it is 65% male. But I can imagine why. 65% male looking at Facebook Turkey. Lately, I saw these statistics. 83% of the, pics, the pictures are with hashtags. So the pictures, almost all of them are hashtags. So it's not about the photos. It is about sharing stories. Now I'm going to ask you a question. Which hashtag is the most popular one up until now? Which one is? Tax for life, good guess, but it's not. Photo of the day, good guess, but it's not. Love is the most popular hashtag. 
This morning I checked it, I think it was at 10 o'clock this morning, because every morning I'm checking it to revise my presentations, it was more than 888 million something. It is on the increase every single second. So, since Adam and Eve, we have been after this. <laughs> and it's not about technology. Technology is just a tool. We are always after what we don't have. So, Instagram and similar certain platforms are just tools to reach what we are longing for. And you know what? Young generation, it is not possible to retain or engage them with more technology because they already have it. But it's possible to engage and retain them with more emotions because they like it. But generally, when I look at in communications, younger systems communications, I see a sort of mistake, which is giving them more technology. It is not about technology, okay? It is a tool. The outcome is the emotional setting that we can create for them. And in the second part of my presentation, I'm going to share with you a couple of tools maybe you can make use of, a couple of hints. So, John Nesbitt says, I love this really, now as 21st century students, citizens, we are drowning in data, yet starving for knowledge. Everywhere, every single day, millions and millions and millions of data is coming towards our young users, knowledge users, but we are starving for knowledge still. So this is what we call infobesity. <laughs> this is called infobesity. And as English language teachers, instructors, what you are doing every single day is you are feeding this bird. You are feeding this bird and it's going to explode. So today I don't believe in being a teacher. I don't believe in being an instructor. I have never ever called myself as a trainer. I always call myself as a lifelong learner. And I think there is no manager anymore. There is no leader. There is no teacher and there is no instructor. We don't need any of them in this century. We need curators. You all need to be curators. You all need to be helping people make this bird slimmer, which we call idea curators. We have to serve our young generation students and young professionals, young ELT professionals, some new ways to get rid of redundant information because they know a lot, believe me. And we don't need any more data. We just need some curation. So, uh, so what? what, what why did I have uh, such a long, long, long uh, introduction? A guy whom I adore very, very, very much in my life, and this is actually my life principle. I hope he rests in peace. Albert Einstein says, insanity is doing the same things over and over again and expecting different results. This is what I witness every single day when, I'm work when I am working with corporations. We are always doing the same thing and then we start complaining. I'm working with a lot of human resources people, a lot of HR people, and when we come together with HR people every single day of my career, they are always complaining. We don't understand this young generation because we do a lot of things to retain them, to engage them, to motivate them. We are giving them a lot of money, iPhone 6, tablets, this and that, but they are still not happy and they are leaving our corporations. And I say, could it be possible that maybe you are still using the motivational tools that you were using 10 years ago? For example, maybe you are bringing them to a company picnic once a year and you expect them to be happy whole year. <laughs> This is what we do in the corporations. And they said, yeah, might be, yeah, yeah. This year we again invited them for a company picnic and actually 35% didn't even participate. So we should change the mindset, okay? Because motivational theory has been changing tremendously during the last 10 years. What were called motivational factors 10 years ago, now they are called hygienic factors. There is a tremendous shift and change. So in order to understand what things we could do differently, we should understand what we used to do in our past. So it is never enough to understand a certain generation like Gen Yers or Gen Z, but you should have a very closed eye on starting from silent generation. I always start working with, in my seminars and in my consultancy business, I always working with generations starting at silent generation. I'm not going to give you a history class, which could be very boring. I have very limited time here, but I just want to show you a snapshot of generations, particularly uh, 
valid in the Middle Eastern context. So silent generation, everywhere it is called, globally it is called silent generation. In Turkey, we call it sessiznesi. Silent generation has been uh, around the world in between these years, but the um, code of this generation is, it is conservatism period, the period of conservatism, spiritual period. Generational systems thinking believe that in every 80 to 100 years, the system is completed. It's a 360 thinking, okay? Generational thinking is a 360 thinking. So in every 80 to 100 years, we repeat ourselves sociologically. That is why in this screen, actually, there is also Gen Z. Can you see it? Because it is a cycle, okay? So, if you want to understand Gen Z, there is one generation that you should understand very well, which is silent generation. Because now that we completed the cycle and we are even about to complete this part of this cycle, we call it a cyclus. Uh, so that's why we should understand silent generation. It's a war period, actually. There is the Second World War here. There is our independence war in Turkey. And in many important geographies in the world, there is this war item, war concept. And then the war ends, the war stops here, then man comes home. What happens when man is back home? <laughs> Baby, babies boom, okay? That's why the period is called baby boomers. In Turkey, we call it bebek bombardımanı. Baby boomer, it means that the population is now different. Demographics change because there's a very high raise in uh, giving birth. The birth rates are on the, uh, on the increase. But the, the thing, the mindset, again, is very different here because just keep in mind that every single corridor here should attack the previous generation's way of thinking, okay? It should attack and it should tell something just the opposite. So there, there we have spiritualism, conservatism, spiritual thinking, morality, but now we have ideology, okay? These kids oppose their parents, telling that now thinking, ideas, ideology, political thinking, criticism, they, these are more important than the spirit or than uh, the religious items or than conservatism, okay? So we have human rights movements. In Turkey, we have the military coup. For the first time in our history, we have multi-party system, this and that. And this brilliant generation, I really love them a lot, this brilliant generation, baby boomers, give a present to Turkey and to the world, which is called the 68th generation. I have a question for you. I wrote the 68th generation here under Generation X, but actually, who are they? They are baby boomers. But wh why I share it here is because now they are, now they are affecting Gen Xers. I have another question for you. Uh, 68th generation, I'm sure most of your parents belong to, or could witness 68th generation and the expense that we paid during those times. 68th generation, while sending their baby boomers, while sending their Gen Xers, Gen X kids to the school, what do you think they told to their kids while sending their Gen Xers to their schools? Sorry? Be watchful, huh? Be watchful, be watchful. Don't interfere to any of the person around. Olaylara karışma. Don't interfere, be watchful, because there might be other different sort of ideological problems. That is why in the generational systems, there is a highly depoliticized generation, which is Generation X. But up until Gezi movement in Turkey, Generation Y was always labeled as being apolitical. But it was completely wrong. Because in the generational systems, Generation X is highly depoliticized. That is why there is this rising individualism at Generation X. Why I am emphasizing this a lot is, we as Generation Xers, we are very much willing and prone to label Gen Yers as being disloyal, as being less hardworking, less focused, less this and that. But we have our own reasons because we were a very self-centered and highly individualistic generation because life was like that when we were grown up. That is why most of the adjectives describing our generation, Gen Xers, start with the self prefix, self-motivated, self-learner, self this and self that. 
So when you are a self-learner and self-motivated generation, then leaders are very lucky. Then English teachers are also very lucky because we don't have to do a lot of work which we didn't 20 years ago. But now it is not the case, okay? So if you are expecting being self-learners or self-motivated people from this new generation, you can wait for more, actually. I'm not that much optimistic about that. So when we come to Generation X, there is the, uh, there is the peace movement, there is the petrol crisis, there is the booming of the cinema, and there is a very high rise of individualism. And the global world starts right after 1980s in the world and in the Middle East. And Generation Y, actually, there is, a, there is starting from golf crisis to an iPod to a PlayStation generation, everything is very much confusing. The context is really very busy. So globalism has its effects in Turkey as well. One day it is prosperity, the other day it is depression economically. So we have a highly confused and we have a generation who were raised around these years who say that I can only respect you if you deserve it. Because since I was born, I saw a lot of very different interesting cases. I witnessed a lot of interesting cases, so I want you to deserve my respect and my trust. It is something sh which should be earned. So we should understand why this generation is thinking to a certain extent. Gen X, we can actually label them with this word, uh, if we need only one word, competition. Let me ask you a question. Who are we competing with most? Ourselves, very good. A typical Gen Xer answer. We are competing with ourselves. That's why we are very much result-oriented. If you always find yourself telling to your young English language teachers, colleagues, or telling to your young learners, if you always find yourself asking this question, so what? Most probably you have a Gen Xer mindset. It means come with the conclusion, come with the solution to me. Be a result-oriented, solution-oriented person. Okay, very reddish actually. So we are very much a competitive generation, but Gen Xers are like this, but Gen Yers are not that much competitive. They rather ask for creativity. That is why every single year when we are uh, researching thousands of Gen Yers students, young students at Bilgi and at a lot of universities, we ask them this question. What are you planning to do when you graduate? Which department are you going to be working? What is your dream? And every single year, certain departments at companies are on the decrease. And last year, the most problematic department was the sales department. They don't want to be sales professionals. They don't want to be supply chain professionals. But number one department is always what? Imagine, guess, marketing. I would love to become a marketing professional when I graduate, they say. But this year, um, I mean last year, something interesting happened. I'm going to show you the statistics in detail as well. I mentioned, as I have mentioned, we are working in 52 countries and we ask the same question at every country that we work with. What are you going to do? Which company are you going to work for when you graduate? Which company? And 17% of 20,000 young people in Turkey, 17, one seven, 17% 17 of 20,000 young people answered like this. What company are you talking about? What do you understand by this answer? Meaning, I'm not going to work any, for any company because I'm against corporations. Because they are boring. I am going to be a part of a startup and I'll start my own business. When I'm talking to big bosses, they are very much surprised to hear that and they say, no, it is impossible, they can't do this. But they don't say, I'm going to build another big university, okay? They say, I'm going to do something small and earn enough. I don't uh, want to be, a, be the richest person in the world or I don't have very big aspirations about this. So when we go back and check the uh, Check the characteristics of the 17% of young people, we see that they are the most brilliant ones, academically and socially. The most brilliant ones do not want to be a part of corporations, a part of a salary earning lifestyle. And the question is, if it is possible to buy in the interest of only 1% of the 17%, we can boom this economy. Believe me, I do believe in this. We can boom this economy. But in Turkey, do we love young people? No. Do we understand them? No. We pretend. 
That is our problem. Political politicians, even we, in four weeks' time, we are going to have an election, and for the first time in their life, kids who were born in, born in 1997 will have the right to vote. Did you know this? 2.5 million new voters are going to be in the system than wires. 2.5 million. And most of the political parties are not aware of this fact. I know this by heart. They don't have an idea. Turkey, medium age is 30. Okay? Turkish assembly, medium age is 55. <laughs> How can we understand young people? How can we change this mindset? How can we pass certain laws to make their life easier? In Turkey, we don't like, we don't love young people, actually. We just pretend. So ideology is something to define baby boomers, and harmony is something to define silent gen. This is a very good news for our young English language teachers. Why? This is very good news for our young English language teachers, because they will be in their career, they will be mostly with another generation, which is? Gen Z, and we are expecting Gen Z to be, to be the most harmonious generation in the system. So you are lucky. I always tell this when uh, the, the teachers, instructors who are just at the beginning of their career, you are lucky. So, baby boomers, even Coke communication was different. For a better start in life, start Coke earlier. <laughs> this is 1950s Istanbul, Machka. Okay? So this was the world. How about Turkey? Turkey was uh, interesting. Uh, globally, we call this sandwich generation, but in Turkey, we had rural depopulation, and uh, for 1,000 people, we had 18 telephones in Turkey. 1,000 people, 18 telephones. For one per 1,000 people, we had four automobiles. That is why in the professional life now, still, even in uh, this 21st century, automobiles and telephones are motivational factors and status symbols. When you become manager, you have a better telephone, okay? When you become a director, you have a better car. But these kids, these young people, <laughs> I mean, it's very funny for them, okay? It's not a motivational factor for them. Access to electricity was only in big cities in Turkey, back to the baby boomer period, but keep this uh, number in mind. In 1971, there were only nine universities, and the number of graduates were 3,030. So when they graduated, they were the general managers in the public industry, okay? So life was fun, actually. It was easier, okay? There was no competition at all, so it was easier. But then something happened, things changed, and our generation came. Life started to be competitive, even our toys were confusing. <laughs> life started to be competitive. It was harder, and even Coke started to say, tell something different. It is the real thing. Let's talk about the real things. Okay, it's a sharper communication now. And now we had bigger ambitions, building the first bridge, 1970s, Istanbul. So the computers, Michael, this and that, everything started to change, and the numbers, of course, they changed. This generation is also called latchkey generation. Why? Because most of you as kids, Gen Xers, you had your own keys even here or in your pockets. When you were primary school students, most of you had, I believe you had your own keys, home keys, meaning there were no nannies, no extra work at school, so you were self-learners, self-motivated people, doing their homework alone, huh? This and that, self-learners, self-motivated people. And they were more, fo more focused on money and there became more women at work life. That is why, looking at Gen Xers, divorce rate is on the increase because there were more women at work life, meaning there was, a, there was a rising individualism, but please don't be attached to this individualism as Gen Xers when you are trying to understand Gen Yers, because Gen Yers and uh, Gen Z, in a certain extent, it's not about individualism, it is about the community now, okay? Community is the tag now, community is the uh, main word, it's not about individualism. So, divorce rate was on the increase, and in 1992, there were 53 universities. Remember, it was only nine, but now it is 53. Now, the number of graduates are 33,000. So, the system started to tell Gen Xers that, my dear, there are, like you, there are 33,000 graduates, so tell me, how you would differentiate yourself from the crowd. This was a very popular uh, saying for Gen Xers, differentiate yourself from the crowd. 
If you want Gen Yers to hate you, you can keep doing this. Tell them, differentiate yourself. <laughs> Tell me how will you differentiate yourself. But uh, I'm working with over 300 companies, as I have mentioned, and I don't have even one single client who doesn't tell this wording, differentiate yourself. But it's all about Seth Godin. Do you know Seth Godin? Seth Godin, a very nice marketing professional, I really love him a lot. 20 years ago, or 15 years ago, Seth Godin wrote a book for Gen Xers. Do you know that book? It was called Purple Cow. Purple Cow? Do you know this? Purple Cow? Meaning, uh, you should differentiate yourself being a purple cow, because all the cows are brown, so you, want, you have to be purple. So this was the message given to Gen Xers. Do whatever you want, have two uh, postgraduates, learn more languages, sleep less, okay? Leave the office later than your colleagues, differentiate yourself, right? <laughs> differentiate yourself. But Seth Godin, two years ago, came back and said, hey, I have a surprise for you. Now, we have a different set of ideas because of this young generation. So, purple cow is dead. Forget about him. Now, we have another book, and he wrote another book. The name of the book is Tribes. He says, now tribes are your community. In your classroom, in your learning setting, don't forget that you are not talking to purple cows, individuals anymore. You are talking to a crowd of people who are the new tribe. So you should understand the tribe. Your external clients are tribes as well. There is a very high rise of communal thinking looking at this young new generation. Even Coke understood this, and now Coke doesn't talk about the product anymore. Now it is talking about the tribe, festivals, atmosphere, context. And now we have a new Istanbul, actually. So I love this, really. This is a, a global study from Kelly Consulting Company uh, about Gen Wires. They want everything yesterday. It is something good about Gen Yers and even Gen Z. Yes, they want everything yesterday because there is a very fast pace of change. So, uh, looking at uh, today, we have over 196 universities. Actually, now, um, two weeks ago, we have nine, 198 universities because two new universities passed at the Turkish National Assembly a couple of weeks ago. So, there are 198 universities in Turkey and number of graduates is over 700,000, but still, we can't reach uh, enough number of young people when we are looking to recruit young people. We can't reach them. Also, there is 28% of youth unemployment in Turkey. By the way, please do not trust this number because this number is the official number. You know, in Turkey, there is a lot of unofficial un uh, employment, which is called hidden unemployment. So, looking at hidden unemployment, the real unemployment rate is Tur in Turkey the youth unemployment rate in Turkey is over 35%. 35% of young people are actually unemployed in Turkey. Why? Because they are very rich. Why? Because they can't find jobs. No, nothing. Because they reject being a part of what they do not want to be a part of. They prefer being unemployed. Most of them prefer being unemployed. There is a very big systems problem here. But we have got money. It is not about affluence. We've got 72 million number of mobile subscribers. Lately I saw this, I came across with this at Facebook, this uh, Gen Z guys for children, for kids of Gen Z. And with the help of only a uh, paper and two board markers, they are communicating with the world. And the uh, wording is, hi world, we want a puppy. Our dad said we could get one if we get one million likes, so like this. And there's a little PS here. He doesn't think we can do. <laughs> when I saw this picture, I liked it. And I saw that my like was among 2.5 million likes. <laughs> Apparently, by the way, the father is a Gen Xer because he gave the quota. <laughs> Target-oriented, result-oriented dad. And I started wondering, where are these guys? Because apparently they are not Turkish. Where are they? And I found out that they are living in Australia, on the other edge of the world. 
in Australia. They are living in Australia, on the other edge of the world, and they have the ability to contact me as a woman in the street in the Middle East and to receive my support. The question is not about Gen Wires anymore. You should ask yourself, are you ready for such a generation? Is your classroom setting ready for such a generation? Lately, I was working with a blue jean producer in Turkey. Actually, we are proud of them because they are a local brand, but they are very successful globally. And I asked the same question to the big bosses of the company. I said, are you ready for such a generation? And they said, of course we are. Didn't you see our production line, they said. And one of the uh, board members told me, hey, I find you quite cynical, he said. Aren't you sure that we are ready for Gen Z? And I said, I am afraid you are not ready for Gen Z. And why, he said. And I said, first, as a Gen Z mom, second, as a generational systems researcher, I said, most of you will understand now, who, most of you, those who are uh, parenting Gen Z, will understand what I will tell you now. And I said, you are not ready for Gen Z because Gen Z, they don't want to wear jeans. Boys want to wear sports trainers, and girls want to wear tights. They don't want to wear jeans, and they were amazed. And actually, one of the big bosses, he was furious, and he said, there was this R&D guys there, and he said, do something about this. Because, <laughs> because I asked them, what if three million less blue jeans are sold tomorrow morning? What if? client, the customer, is not going to buy your product anymore three years later. What will you do in this brilliant, beautiful production hall you have? So it is not about the content anymore. It is about the context. I am fed up with hearing content curriculum everywhere. It is about the context, context of learning, actually. So, in Turkey, on average, kids start using computers at the age of eight, using internet at the age of nine, using mobile phones at the age of 10. All around Turkey. I am sure in this hall, many of you have kids who start using internet at the age of three, but we are not typical Turkish parents, okay? We are niche parents. You see what I mean? When you go to the eastern Turkey, northern Turkey, southern Turkey, the situation might differ. So this is an average. So this means that you are going to employ these kids as English language instructors and you are not going to give them mobile phones or computers or laptops or you're not going to have them think whatever they want. We are not going to be able to sell them anything. We are not going to be able to recruit them with the current systems that we have. That is why we don't need an evolution in generational systems thinking but we need some sort of revolution actually. Revolution. This is a typical Gen Z cartoon from Sarah Zimmerman. Brilliant, really. Are you ready for a certain generation? <laughs> Revolting against an oppressive government that is trying to remove their civil rights. <laughs> yeah. A typical Gen Z. So it's going to be about rising consciousness. Okay? Rising consciousness. So. Medium age, 30.7 in Turkey, Gen Wires, 35%, Gen Z, 25%, and they are still uh, coming. Uh, these are going to become extinct soon, 3%, and we will have more Gen Zs. This is life, you know. We are all going to die, you know. Huh? Sometimes we forget. Every morning, I remind myself that I'm going to die one day. So life is not that much uh, taken into account that much seriously. So this is the world over seven billion people, and uh, this is the world generational segmentation. And let me tell you one thing. In 10 years' time, when we are in 2020, uh, 25, in 2025, 65% uh, of all working people, labor population, are going to be consisting of Gen Wires. Let me tell it once again. In 10 years' time, globally, 65% of all working class, working people who are earning money will consist of Gen Wires, meaning Generation Wires are going to lead the economy in 10 years' time. If they don't like you, they are not going to 
let you survive as a university, as an instructor, or as a human being, or as a factory, or as a company. They're going to lead the economy. Love them or hate them, but you should hear them. You should hear what they are telling to us. Very much facilitated, very much, in, too much instructor-led certain way of teaching and learning, it is outmoded. Actually, it's a baby boomer thing, okay? Books, PowerPoints, handouts, curriculum, content, it is a baby boomer thing. I'm not an ELT professional. Uh, please excuse me if I uh, push my limits. But this is just my idea because I am also working with learning and development departments of companies. So learning and development is a very top agenda for us in the corporate life as well. Looking at Gen X, how do we learn? We are self-learners. We focus on outcomes. So what? When will I learn this? Okay? So we are self-learners. So we have the control over, uh, over our uh, our own learning, but when we come to Gen Yers, they need inspiration. They don't need instructors. They don't need teachers, if you ask me. They need people giving them inspirations, curators, because they are meaning-seeking. That is why they are called Generation Y. Why? In Turkey, I call them nasıl yani? <laughs> why? Why? I am seeking meaning. <laughs> That's why they are asking a lot of questions. Why, why, why not, or why? Okay, nasıl yani? Meaning seeking. And the influence is peer influence. This is very important. Now it's not an individualistic learning way anymore. It's a peer influence, okay? And they are influenced by experts, of course, baby boomers. We are going to have a keynote speaker. You, go, you can go to tell them. We're going to have a keynote speaker who, is, who has over 30 years of experience. Okay, then it's good. He or she might be an expert in the field. But the world is not such like, such now, okay? When we look at uh, Gen Xers, they are influenced by cases, meaning uh, at a foundation school, we applied this and it was successful, so you can do it, okay? But Gen Yers, they are influenced by peers. Two Ps are very important for Gen Yers. Peers and, what is the second P? Never forget this, parents. Peers and parents, two Ps are very important. Do you remember Gezi? One day, Muammer Güler, uh, back then he was the interior uh, minister, am I mistaken? Yeah, he was, he was that. One day he, he said, I am talking to the parents, please get your kids back to your homes. And I said, oh my God, two P fact will start tomorrow at Gezi. <laughs> and do you remember what happened at Gezi the other morning? The parents were there. And it was even more crowded. Two P, peers and parents. Drive to learn. What are the benefits of learning? What are the benefits of learning? What is the function of learning? This is very important. This is a key question. Gen X, I'm not taught. I learn. I don't need you to teach me. Actually, I learn. Okay? I'm not sold. I buy. I'm not fired. I choose to go. This is a Gen X thinking. <laughs> and then why? How do people like me learn? People like me, my peers, how do they learn? They learn this way? Okay, I can learn this way. Very communal sort of thinking, okay? So, by the way, I'm going to share this presentation with you, the soft copy, so. There is a constant feedback demand here, and there is short attention span, so we should even decrease the class hours, if you ask me. If you ask me, we should decrease the class hours. <laughs> In the corporate life, this is something I'm struggling a lot because, you know, we have induction periods. When we have these kids in the system, in the corporations, you know, at some of my clients, the induction period, the courses, the trainings, last for like three months, two months, and these kids want to kill themselves. Three months courses, in-class trainings, they hate it. By the way, they hate in-class trainings. Research says this. We are asking to kids from Bill University, kids from the rest of the universities, and they, don't, they, they dislike uh, in-class learning. That's why we should support the very much blended learning with less class hours, if you ask me. They don't want to work hard, but they want to work effectively. They don't want to work hard. It doesn't mean that they are lazy, because they know for sure that there is a couple of ways to work more effectively. Less hours, more outcome, okay? And they adore authenticity. So, the only sort of leadership which will be very valid today is authentic leader. 
authentic teacher, authentic instructor, very much unique in the character and very much trustable. They, and they say, respect should be earned. I can't respect you because you are a director, because you are the general manager, because you are my instructor. That's not the case anymore. You should earn my respect, okay? They are against status quo. Very different from Gen Xers. And two Ps are essential, parents and peers. So, finally, I'm going to introduce you. I, I think I ex exceeded my time. I'm very sorry. That, can you give me five more minutes? Five minutes only, huh? Or two, two, I can manage it in two minutes as well. Two, okay, I'm very sorry indeed. <laughs> this is all what I always do. I'm going to share with you five nights to combat conventional methods, five nights, okay? And I'm going to share with you the files so you can see the examples, the cases also. The first night is prosumers. Any of you who have heard this word, prosumer, we don't have consumers of knowledge, consumers of information anymore. We don't have consumers anymore. Coke consumer, trousers consumers, English language consumer. There's no consumer anymore. Anymore. Young people are prosumers. It's a made up word. Made up word, produce and consume. It means I want to consume what I produce. It means you should crowdsource. You should have inclusion. You should co-create the class content, co-create the curriculum. That's what we are doing in the corporate life, actually. The second one is social media literacy. Any leader, any instructor, anybody on earth serving this generation should have social media literacy. We don't have any excuse. Yeah, but I hate Facebook. It's not an excuse. Personally, I hate Facebook. But I have a very strong Facebook account because otherwise I, don't, I can't understand the way their mind is operating. Edutainment, I, I'm sure you know this. Edutainment, there's no education anymore if you ask me. That, that is now edutainment. What we are doing in corporations is actually edutainment again, including a lot of fun. And we have reverse mentoring. This is a very strong tool, reverse mentoring. In the corporate arena, we have been doing a lot of very successful projects about re reverse mentoring. And university campuses are best places to do reverse mentoring, best places. And we have context, more focus on context than the content itself. In just 30 minutes, producer plus consumer, we have now prosumers because they want opportunities to create their own content. Please let me create my own content. Let me show you some examples. You know Khan Academy, it's a very good, very good, brilliant prosumer example. It is free and it is a user-generated content. You know Duolingo? It's in your profession. You can check it. It's a very big and very good example. You know Lyle Mocha? These are all prosumer cases, prosumers, okay? So I want to be included in the system when the system is being generated. Social media literacy, because you can respond to, their, to your feedback dependent learners through digitally delivered feedback. Digitally delivered feedback is a key in your classroom setting. I'll skip this. So the question is not anymore, how can I keep my students from using e-devices in class? Oh my God, they are using cell phones in class. I'm, go I'm going to die. No, it's not the case anymore. The question is, how can I use e-tools to get and keep my students motivated? This is the new question, actually. Entertainment, because you had better make your lecture a place where students want to be where learning is fun. What is your life purpose? A question which was asked to more than 500,000 students every year, okay? And top one, to have a good work-life balance, to live life to the fullest. More than 50% says, I want to have fun in my life. I want to enjoy life. And then comes financial independence, this and that. And look at success. To be seen by others as being successful, 2.7%. And you're still having examinations and giving grades to them. But 2.7% says, actually, I don't give much importance to being labeled as successful. I want to be labeled as someone who is happy, okay? So, reverse mentoring, because you can learn from them. Switch is a um, project we are doing at Akbank in Turkey for the last two years. We are the general managers and the deputy general managers. We are learning from Gen Wires, the new recruited people who were born after 1990s, we are learning from them. 
Apprentice to Master, it is the project of uh, Yıldız Holding. Maybe you are reading it in the press because Murat Ülker is always talking about this project recently. Uh, Murat Ülker, the uh, big boss of Yıldız Holding and his team, they are learning from university students and young graduates about the facts of this new life. And they are learning a lot. We are learning from them. And you can marry content with context because if content is the king, context is the queen. What is context? Let me tell you finally. Content is the product, your curriculum, your agenda, your books, texts, okay? But context, it is the setting. And in the context, there is the peers, the feelings, the emotions, and better than that, there are the stories, the experience. I am so sorry that I took a lot of time of yours, but thank you for your patience. I hope to meet you again. Thank you so much.